Hello friends, today we're going to talk about oxygen therapy. And uh, we all know the oxygen we breathe uh, comes from the air, which also has 78% uh, nitrogen, uh, very small amounts of carbon dioxide and other inert gases uh, like argon and helium. Now oxygen fulfills its metabolic role at the mitochondrial level. And the inspired oxygen tension represents the highest value in the ascending sequence of oxygen tension concerned with delivery, delivering oxygen to the mitochondria. And this is explained uh, by the uh, oxygen cascade, which I'll describe in a minute. So the oxygen we breathe reaches the alveoli uh, through the uh, a gas transport zone, which is constitutes the anatomical dead space, and uh, in human beings, the dead is around 150 mLs. Then it passes through the gas exchange zones, uh, which starts from the respiratory bronchioles, uh, reaching the alveoli. So it is at the alveoli level where the gas exchange occurs. The uh, oxygen is taken up and the carbon dioxide is uh, given out. So this constitutes the ventilation perfusion. And uh, the interface uh, which is uh, present between the, uh, the lungs and the circulation is very thin. It is uh, only around 0 0.5 micrometer um, thick. So at this interface, the alveolar capillary interface, the hemoglobin uh, carries, the deoxygenated hemoglobin actually carries the uh, carbon dioxide and it releases it at the alveoli and then takes up the oxygen uh, to be delivered to the tissue level. And this happens uh, very quickly because uh, hemoglobin in its R form, that is a relaxed form, uh, has got cooperativity. Uh, so once one molecule of oxygen is combined with the uh, hemoglobin, it rapidly allows uh, the combination of the other three molecules. So this is called cooperativity of uh, hemoglobin to pick up the oxygen from the circulation. Like I said, at the tissue level and the carbon dioxide is taken up because it is produced at part of uh, metabolism and oxygen is uh, you know given out at the tissue level. And this becomes possible because uh, the deoxygenated hemoglobin um, is got higher affinity for carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions. Okay, so there is formation of carbon amino uh, hemoglobin uh, uh, in the uh, in our, the tissue level uh, within the RBC. So it uh, delivers the oxygen and uh, takes up the uh, you know carbon dioxide. In the cell, as all something else happens, that the carbon dioxide which is taken up, it combines with water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase, which is plenty in the RBCs to form carbonic acid. This carbonic acid then dissociates into hydrogen ions and to bicarbonate ions. And it is this uh, hydrogen ions which combines with the your deoxygenated hemoglobin. It's got very high affinity for that. And the bicarb is uh, then uh, an exchange with chloride. So this is called the chloride shift. Uh, in, and this requires energy. So we have an ion, an ion exchanger or AE1 or band 3 uh, you know, at the surface of the RBCs. This helps in uh, accepting chloride and uh, giving out uh, bicarb. Along with that, uh, uh, what happens is there is increase in the water as well. So at the tissue level, the red cells are actually in larger size than when they are actually uh, present in the uh, alveoli. So there are two effects, the Bohr and Haldane effects, which uh, helps uh, in promoting oxygen binding and carbon dioxide release in the pulmonary capillaries. And this reverse happens in the tissue level. That means the carbon dioxide is taken up and the oxygen is released. So these are the two effects uh, which all of us actually uh, are aware of. Uh, and uh, you 
who people who are interested in obstetrics will also know there is also called something called double bore effect which happens at the placental level okay it's same again so baby is able to take up oxygen and uh, release carbon dioxide uh, okay because of this effect so if the carbon dioxide the partial pressure of carbon dioxide we breathe is around 21.3 kPa it's easy to actually talk in terms of kPa because percentage and kPa actually match and the uh, partial pressure of oxygen uh, in the atmospheric pressure okay so it's 21 by 100 kPa which is 100 kPa is equal to 760 meters of mercury so it becomes 21 percent so from the atmospheric pressure and the alveoli it reaches the alveoli uh, and during this passage uh, through the nose uh, the the air we breathe is humidified so it picks up water so the partial pressure of oxygen actually drops because of the presence of water vapor so partial pressure of the water vapor is 47 millimeters of mercury so this brings down the uh, PaO2 and then at the arterial level the PaO2 drops to 13.3 and this happens because <clears throat> of the presence of the uh, the shunts okay and a bit of dead space which is actually present now reaches the capillary further drops to 6.8 and at the mitral condyle level it is 0 0.3 to 1.3 kPa <coughs> this is the oxygen oxygen whirlpool so we can see there is a constant gradient uh, built uh, from the alveolus to the uh, your mitochondrial level this is also known as the oxygen cascade and so this is the stepwise reduction in the partial pressure of oxygen and uh, so the partial pressure of oxygen is uh, is defined by the uh, your ga alveolar gas equation this is a very important equation which everyone uh, need to know so the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli so pao2 is equal to pio2 minus paco2 by r so that is the alveolar CO2 level, which equates almost to the uh, your arterial uh, PaCO2. So uh, the same value, <coughs> and respiratory coefficient is 0 0.8 in everyone. So if you look at the PI2, PI2 is basically the barometric pressure minus the pressure partial pressure of water vapors. That is 47. So it's 760 minus uh, 47. F I two is twenty one, and uh, that comes to around five hundred thirteen uh, minus uh, the P A O two, which is uh, forty milliliters of mercury and zero point eight. So, if you actually to make these calculations, the partial pressure is just about one hundred fifty in the uh, alveolus. And so, the effects of the uh, uh, you know uh, the shunting and diffusion and then our utilization of oxygen is further drops to like i said uh, almost to 1.6 kpa uh, at the mitochondrial level so this is the oxygen cascade but the most important uh, you know thing we need to remember here is the alveolar gas equation pao2 is equal to pi2 minus paco2 by r where pi2 is equal to p b which is the barometric pressure minus the water pressure water wave pressure into the fio2 so you can actually see that the only parameters we can actually control in the partial pressure oxygen is the FiO2. Uh, we can control PaCO2 in uh, some way. You know, you can uh, hyperventilate patient and bring down the PaCO2. So once you bring down the PaCO2, then uh, the ratio uh, that is uh, PaCO2 by R is reduced. So normally it's 40 uh, by 0.8. So that is 50 milliliters mercury. If you reduce it by say uh, 20 then it becomes 25 you know so it can actually increase the pao2 by hyperventilation but to a very small amount so the only way to increase the P, uh, pao2 is by increasing the fi2 that is by delivering oxygen so that's where the oxygen therapy actually comes in but there's more uh, to just the oxygen therapy so we need to also un understand what are dead space and shunts so when there is any uh, you know blockade of the circulation and uh, then what happens is that uh, the ventilation to that part that 
the circulation supplies is wasted so this is a wasted ventilation right so the rest of the part is actually yeah, you know taking part in the uh, gas exchange uh, but this part of the alveoli or the lungs are not taking this constitute the dead space this is a functional dead space anatomical dead space is fixed in all of us uh, which is like said the uh, uh, you know transport zone of the respiratory system which is around 150 minutes of mercury but so this is the functional dead space which actually happens uh, because of the uh, you know some amount of blockade to the pulmonary circulation example is like in a small uh, pulmonary embolus okay. but uh, if there is a plugging of the uh, you know the airways uh, happens in uh, uh, you know patients uh, who develops chest infection then uh, the circulation uh, which is coming to this part of the alveoli is uh, you know uh, going to mix with the uh, without picking up any carbon dioxide or delivering uh, the co2 so uh, this will likely cause venous admixture uh, so this is called uh, shunting and um, so there are some physiological shunting happening uh, uh, within within the uh, you know normal uh, physiological uh, parameters so and that is all we all have all of us have around four to five percent uh, shunts uh, within the body okay so the this is the uh, you know the venous blood draining uh, straight away into the left side of the circulation without getting oxygenated so that's those are shunts so this graph is very important these are called iso shunt lines and you can actually see that uh, in the when your uh, shunts are zero to five percent then uh, as you increase the uh, your uh, inspired oxygen concentration the partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries or in the alveoli actually increases so let's say at 21 percent the pa2 is above 100 and if you increase the uh, uh, your FiO2 by 40% and the uh, PaO2 actually almost goes up to 250. Note, if your shunt increases to 15%, to achieve this 250 millimeters of mercury partial pressure, you actually have to give 80% oxygen. Okay. Or if the shunt is 10%, then you have to increase the your FiO2 to 60%. But once the shunt actually reach uh, uh, about 25%, so more than one fourth, then you can actually see that trying to get uh, to the PO2, to your normal PO2, you require saturation about 90%. But once they are at 50%, whatever you do, uh, it's not going to actually improve the PO2 at all. So you need to look at the reasons why this shunting is happening uh, in the body. Is it because in children because of uh, some cardiac lesions uh, or uh, in adults is because of large amounts of the your alveoli are collapsing okay or the patient is developing bronchopneumonia okay so you need to actually treat the cause for that so the oxygen which is available at the tissue level like depends on uh, your uh, uh, arterial oxygen content so the amount of oxygen that is bound to the oxygen and very small amount of oxygen that is dissolved so per minute this depends also on if you multiply by cardiac output this is the called the oxygen flux so if you assume that the cardiac output is 5 liters hemoglobin is around 14.5 percent oxygen well saturated then this value comes to around a liter. So that is our oxygen flux or oxygen, uh, oxygen available uh, to the tissues. But we only consume around 4 to 5 ml of oxygen per minute or per kg per minute. And that comes to around 250 ml per minute. So if you look at the ratio of the consumption okay, to the availability, so that is called coefficient of utilization okay or this is also known as oxygen delivery in uh, some ddo2 this comes to around 25 percent okay so if there is a, uh, a you know uh, reduction in the available oxygen with normal consumption then <clears throat> the coefficient of utilization will increase and increase in oxygen consumption occurs very commonly okay 
This can happen because of the patient is shivering, so the oxygen requirement actually goes up or consumption goes up by almost 300 percent. Or there is uh, uh, the drop in hemoglobin, which is very common after a surgery. Or there may be effect of certain anesthetic agent, which would have actually caused uh, the drop in cardiac output. Okay, so these are common situations in the post-operative period that happen. So wherever there is a ventilation perfusion mismatch happening, okay, whether uh, uh, you know, it is because of any disease process, because of an injury or because of a normal condition, you would actually need to give extra oxygen to the patients. So let's look at a common condition uh, which you can face. So you have a patient who has got a low cardiac output state, uh, who has got a low PaO2, okay, and uh, has got a saturation of not even percent. So in that case, the oxygen, uh, you know, the flux is reduced to 385. And we, if we assume that the oxygen consumption remains the same to 50, the coefficient of utilization is reduced or increased to 65%, and this causes a reduction in safety margin. Okay. So if you look at the graph of the oxygen delivery, okay, the oxygen flux uh, versus the oxygen consumption, we can actually see that uh, in the graph from uh, C to B, and the, it is constant, the oxygen uh, consumption is constant uh, till and the uh, coefficient of utilization is 0 0.6. Once the coefficient of utilization actually increases further from 0 0.6, then the it all becomes supply dependent. So, uh, so up to 0 0.6, it is supply independent uh, in normal, normal uh, patients, okay. In critical ill, you can actually see the dotted line, and it is actually, uh, you know, quite steep uh, compared uh, to the normal. And this this happens that uh, because in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, critical ill patient, uh, they may not be there's maybe reduction of the oxygen uh, delivery to the tissues, and uh, there may be decrease in consumption as well at the tissue level, okay, so the patient has become very acidotic in these conditions. So, high uh, coefficient of utilization uh, leads to relative tissue hypoxia. So there's not, there is increased uh, requirement, there is reduced delivery, so uh, anaerobic metabolism sets in. Uh, when the anaer anaerobic metabolism sets in, there is metabolic acidosis. And we know from the oxygen dissociation curve that uh, the increase in hydrogen ions uh, shifts or acidosis shifts the uh, curve to the right. That means we require higher oxygen uh, concentrations or uh, partial pressure of oxygen to maintain the same oxygen saturation at the tissue levels. It is also seen that metabolic acidosis affects the cardiac contractility and cardiac output as well. So that further reduces the oxygen delivery to the tissues so we can see that there is further increase in the coefficient of utilization and becomes a vicious cycle till you actually sort out uh, this tissue hypoxia uh, by uh, you know uh, reducing the oxygen uh, requirements and increasing the oxygen delivery so yes i was talking about oxygen dissociation curve all of you actually know this is sigmoid say shape curve so the upper part of the curve uh, which is a flatter part that is uh, is not affected much um, uh, okay but if you look uh, if we have to compare uh, you know the conditions various conditions then we talk about something called p50 uh, which is in, in the middle part of the steeper part of the the sigmoid curve so when you talk about the shift to the right, shift to the left, then we are talking in terms of the change in the P50. So when the amount of hydrogen ions in the body increases, that is there is acidosis or there is increase in temperature or there is anaerobic metabolism, which leads to increase in 2,3 DPG. So hydrogen ions and 2,3 DPG are avidly born to deoxygenate hemoglobin or the tau form or the tense form of the hemoglobin, which is at the tissue level. And if they are actually bound uh, to that, then they will not allow the oxygen to be bound to the 
uh, hemoglobin. So there is a shift of the curve to the right. Okay, so you require higher partial pressure of oxygen to achieve the same oxygen percentage. Okay. So in the post-operative period, um, the patients require oxygen. Um, the commonest cause, obviously, is diffusion of hypoxia. Okay. Ox nitrous oxide tends to diffuse a lot more quickly and uh, dilute the oxygen present in the alveoli. So unless you actually deliver 100% oxygen or provide higher FiO2, uh, the patient can become hypoxic. Yeah, so, but as long as patient is breathing and they are able to actually, uh, you know, get rid of this nitrous oxide, uh, so they, they, as long as you supply some extra oxygen, the desaturation do not happen. Also, in long procedure, the patient has been lying down, and if you do not apply PEEP, uh, there is basolateral actosis, which leads to shunting, and I've shown that more the shunting, the great amount of oxygen required to maintain the same, uh, you know, oxygen uh, saturation. Okay, so you require higher saturation FiO2 to maintain the same PaO2. So from this graph, you can actually see that at the age of 45, the closing uh, volume actually increases the functional arterial capacity. And that means when the closing capacity exceeds the functional arterial capacity, then the alveoli will start collapsing. So there are there will be atelectasis. So this happens even in the normal patients. So if they lie down, there will some amount of the uh, you know alveoli will collapse. The closing capacity uh, exceeds, or so closing volume exceeds the functional residual capacity at around 65 years of age, and even in sitting position. So uh, these elderly patients will start actually having some amount of atelectasis even uh, you know, while they're sitting sitting up. And under anesthesia, you can uh, see that. Uh, this will be more evident. So it's important that in, uh, in patients about 45 years that you actually start applying PEEP uh, at the very beginning of the surgery or recruit the lungs uh, uh, before uh, you wake them up and uh, maybe extubate them uh, while they're sitting up a bit, okay? And uh, provide them oxygen because they will desaturate quickly in the recovery period. So this is just a flow chart looking at various aspects of the oxygen uh, delivery to the tissues. So we've uh, seen the uh, you know the effect of the cardiac output, effect of the uh, oxygen uh, which is delivered by the hemoglobin. Okay, and obviously we uh, look at the factors like ventilation, which can affect the blood pH. The blood pH also affects the P50. Okay, then we're also looking at 2,3 dPG. So if there is not enough oxygen delivered to the tissue, that will increase. The ratio of the uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin to oxygenated hemoglobin is important. And uh, tissue metabolism, CO2 levels. So they, all this is the interplay between the various factors uh, that affect the tissue oxygen delivery. So factors that decrease the oxygen availability is basically uh, the low arterial oxygen contents, the factors affecting the oxygen content. So these are low saturation uh, low PO2 and anemia. So we actually have seen uh, that uh, you know if the hemoglobin uh, there is not adequate hemoglobin, the oxygen will not be carried. So the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is reduced. Low hemoglobin as occurs in anemia or in uh, certain hemoglobinopathies like carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, and then again there is decrease in oxygen availability. And then, of course, uh, reduction in cardiac output also reduces the, the oxygen flux. So this is about the oxygen flux in, in mainly. And uh, what factors increase oxygen requirement or raise the uh, coefficient of utilization? Then patients requiring more oxygen uh, when they're shivering or there are increased respiratory efforts. For example, if patient is in distress, they will start using their respiratory muscles more uh, so their oxygen consumption actually increases. They will become tachycardic, okay. And uh, the muscle use might generate more, uh, you know, temperatures, so we can make hyperparaxia. Hyperparaxia is, is not that common uh, in the uh, recovery phase. It's more of hypothermia rather than hyper. 
but uh, we discussed a few days back, we discussed about the malignant hyperexia, which can happen in the recovery as well. That increases oxygen requirements massively. So measures that can be, uh, we can take to increase the availability of oxygen is raise the arterial oxygen tension. Okay, and how do we do it? Uh, we make sure that the FiO2 is good, the amount of oxygen delivery is good, the hemoglobin is good. So raise the hemoglobin if the patient is actually uh, very anemic. We make sure that uh, we take care of the acidosis, make sure there's no, uh, you know, tissue hypoxia happening. There is enough oxygen to be delivered. So I've said that acidosis is causes, uh, you know, the vicious cycle. So you need to increase uh, the, uh, you know, the oxygen delivery, make sure there is no hypoperfusion. If they need to, uh, fluids, give them fluids, uh, increase the cardiac output of the patient. So if they're hypotensive, you find out why they are becoming hypotensive. Is it because they've lost more blood, they've uh, lost volume, they've lost, uh, uh, you know, uh, hemoglobin has dropped? Okay, or oh, there are actually factors uh, which are affecting the uh, contractility, uh, you know, directly. Do you need to actually give them vasopressors or you need to actually institute uh, uh, therapy with anotropes? So has the patient had their cardiac event intraoperatively? And then you can take measures to reduce the requirement. Okay, so in patients, uh, uh, you know, some patients, if they're becoming distressed and the things are spiraling down very quickly, you might actually have to paralyze and intubate them. If the patient is uh, rest of the parameters, okay, but they are, you know, tachycardic, then you might actually have to control heart rate, maybe use beta blockers in them. You might have to cool them down if they are hypothermic. But at the same time, the uh, you might actually, if they're uh, cool, you know, if they're hot, then you might uh, uh, do that deliberately, reduce the uh, temperature, uh, because it also it reduces the oxygen uh, consumption as well, a requirement. So this is normally done in a uh, you know, post-cardiac patient where the cardiac output is so low, and, um, you know, the deliberate uh, hypothermia of 30 to 35 degrees Celsius is helpful. Also done in neurosurgery to uh, reduce, uh, you know, oxygen requirement uh, by the brain, so protecting the brain. So these are the three common things you need to know when you're talking about oxygen delivery, oxygen consumption, okay? So you need to know uh, about the arterial oxygen content or the oxygen flux. Uh, you need to know about the alveolar gas equation, okay, and you need to know about the uh, oxygen dissociation curve, which, uh, you know, the Bohr effect and the Haldane effect, uh, which are important for oxygen take up at the alveoli and delivery of ox uh, carbon dioxide and the opposite happening at the tissue level. So these are important factors to actually understand oxygen delivery and consumption. So if you look at the oxygen therapy devices, we actually have simple oxygen de devices like the nasal cannulas. With nasal cannulas, the FiO2 increases, uh, uh, you know, depending on the flows, uh, it increases by 4% for every additional liter increase in the oxygen flows. So if you give one liter, then assuming the oxygen concentration in the air is 20%, so for ease of calculation, so one liter give 4%, whereas three liters will give you 32%. So these are, uh, you know, the uh, small bore and um, uh, increase uh, in the flows uh, causes in turbulence in the uh, nasal uh, cavities. Uh, patients become very uncomfortable. They're not very well tolerated at high flows. Uh, but we have special uh, catheters, which I will talk uh, in the another lecture, uh, high flow therapy. Uh, these are wide bore, uh, low resistance uh, delivery system and they provide uh, warm humidified oxygen at higher FiO2 and higher flow. So these are actually tolerated a lot more better by, by the patients. Then we have face mask, okay, which again are similar to catheters. So instead of delivering oxygen through the prongs or the nasal uh, catheters, you deliver by the face mask. Again, here it is, FiO2 is dependent on the flow. So these are variable performance devices. Or you can have a rebreather where you actually have reservoir bags so you can actually grieve higher FiO2. These are used more in the accident emergency department uh, where you might get more critically ill patients. 
Then in patients where you cannot actually apply these devices, for example, patients come with severe injuries to the face or they have burns to the upper body. So you can actually use oxygen tents. So these are high uh, capacity systems. And again, in children uh, where, you know, neonates, uh, they actually have the suits or incubators where you can also supply oxygen. So these are high capacity uh, uh, systems. Then we have the uh, fixed performance devices. And uh, here you need to actually have flows up to 15 liters if you want to, uh, you know, achieve higher FiO2. Uh, these are color coded. So the green is, is 60% of where the blue is the lowest is 24%. In our day to day, we use the yellow one, which is 35%, uh, which requires a flow from eight liters per minute. So these devices actually, when you look at them, uh, you actually hold them and they will tell you what percentage uh, they deliver and what flows you need to use with them. You can also actually uh, use uh, your breathing system and this is a water circuit. This is a commonly used breathing system which we have at every bedside in our recovery and also in the emergency departments. So these are the low flow systems. You can deliver much higher FiO2 at a lower flow. So uh, you know, actually can also apply PEEP with a face mask and uh, with the APL valve, we can control the PEEP as well. So if you have to classify the methods of oxygen therapy, then they can be classified as uh, piece, uh, fixed performance uh, systems, uh, which can be high flow, the venturi devices or low flow, the anesthesia circuits. Uh, variable performance devices have been classified into no capacity and capacity system. Uh, capacity system can be small capacity and large capacity systems. So the no capacity systems are basically our oxygen catheters at low flows. And they become a small capacity system when you use it at high flows. So the high flow nasal catheters or high flow nasal oxygen therapy catheters are actually a small capacity catheters. And the oxygen mask without venturi also has got low capacity and these are the large capacity ones are oxygen mask with reservoir or the rebreathers as they call it. or it can be because we use we can't use the normal mask or catheters then oxygen tents hoods and incubators becomes the larger capacity uh, uh, devices so is oxygen therapy harmful yes it can be actually if you deliver high fio2 in someone who doesn't need that uh, high fio2 then denitrogenation of the lung can happen, the uh, nitrogen get uh, washed out like you do for uh, the uh, pre oxygenation And uh, this will lead to absorption atelectasis because as the oxygen is absorbed, there is nothing to splint the uh, alveoli. So nitrogen is important for, uh, you know, keeping it open. And again, then they're uh, with hyperbaric therapy, the oxygen talks to do with hyperbaric therapy. So, but I mean, that is our special situations. And so there are uh, uh, cardiac effects and uh, there are uh, central effects. And the cardiac effects are usually, they have seen that they can be coronary thrombosis with uh, hyperbaric therapy. Also hyperbaric, uh, hyperoxia causes uh, vasoconstriction. So it increases the SVR. And uh, CNS effects, or the, it's also called Paul Bird effect, is normally seen at uh, very high uh, pressures, like three atmospheric pressure. Uh, patients can actually have fits, so that is the oxygen toxicity at hyperbaric therapy, which itself is a, another topic uh, for discussion. So, you actually have dropped a patient to the recovery. The patient had an abdominal surgery, had a laparotomy, everything went fine. You were able to reverse the patient, extubate the patient, brought patient to the recovery, and after some time, you are called to the recovery, and the nurse says. This patient is dropping the saturations. You know, what are you going to do? This was a patient who was 55 years old. Okay, so is not uh, very young. What are you going to do? So first thing you have to look at increasing the delivery. Okay. As soon as you go in, you need to actually increase the FIO2. So if the saturation is borderline low, like 44, 45, sorry, 94, 95, then you can actually increase the FIO2 and then start looking at things. But if the patient is saturating to below 90 degree, 90 percent, then you might actually have to actually take over on a breathing system. Like I said, the best way to deliver high FIO2 
uh, at a lower flow so is a breathing system and you can also apply P. And as I've already explained that there is always alveoli uh, collapse, there is atelectasis in patients more than 45 years when they're actually lying down. And now this patient has anesthesia, they have opened the abdomen, okay, they would have pushed uh, the abdomen, uh, you know, diaphragm against the diaphragm. So atelectasis is, is possible. So you need to actually uh, look at recruiting the uh, collapsed alveoli. You might actually have to apply PEEP. You might actually have to ask the patient to take deep breaths, ask them to actually, you know, cough out if there is anything. Uh, you know, the uh, you could, they could, there could be any mucus plugs. Okay. And basically looking at this, the causes of uh, why there is a decreased you know, uh, saturation delivery at that level. Has the patient bled more than what he thought? The surgeon said, oh, we only had bleeding around 300 to 500, but actually there were actually a lot of packs which we did not notice. So you might actually have to do a hemoglobin level and find out whether the patient requires transfusion. The patient had actually dropped the hemoglobin to seven. Okay. And also I think the best thing is to, even if you don't take arterial blood, take a venous sample, uh, put it into the blood gas and you will get a lot more info information. You would actually see that CO2 might be raised because the patient was not uh, properly reversed. Okay, so uh, you might want to reverse him. That will come into increased consumption level. Um, uh, but it might, uh, the blood gas might show that patient is actually had increased lactate. So the patient was hypovolemic. The hemoglobin had dropped. So you might actually want to give uh, give the patient blood. And um, so once you give blood, give some volume, the lactates will come down and you are able to increase the oxygen delivery. You have increased the FiO2. So the other, the other thing was that the patient was very jittery was that, okay, that should actually point out to that maybe your reversal was not adequate. You can look at the nerve stimulation. Okay, so bring out your peripheral nerve stimulator and the uh, neuromuscular monitor attach it to the patient and look at the twitches you can use dbs double burst stimulation or use train of four make sure that the patient is fully reversed okay then uh, you can also look at if the patient is hypothermic or hypothermic hypothermia is a lot more common okay the patient might be shivering and uh, sometimes that just gives you a false reading but actually the oxygen saturation was fine uh, but it was because he was shivering a bit, so just put a warming blanket on. Make sure patient gets uh, warm fluids. Okay, uh, you can you apply the forced air warmer, as we discussed in previous lectures, and make sure the patient temperature is normal. It should always be about 30.5 degrees Celsius in the recovery. You okay? can never never below 35.5 before patient is discharged. If the patient had had regional anesthesia, you can always give the patient, uh, you know, pethidine or tramadol IV. The, uh, so, so yes, so you look at increase in delivery and reduction in consumption uh, uh, whenever you see that there is a fall in the uh, saturation levels. You have to be very practical when these things happen. And if the patient actually is deteriorating, okay, you might actually have to reintubate the patient, okay. So always take into that into consideration. So that brings us to the end of the lectures and uh, thank you for listening to this lecture.